Fun time. Welcome to the podcast, people. Martin Devlin, Lachlan War. iOS, it's only sport. The only independent daily radio sports show in this country. We air live on the platform one to four every afternoon. If you can't catch us then, well, sit back and enjoy 45 minutes highlights of all the day's sports news today. Special guests on the podcast, Justin Marshall. <laughs> oh, and five, the Crusaders, come on. It's a bit like Max Verstappen not winning the GP, isn't it? I mean, if you're not a Crusaders fan, everyone else is just absolutely loving this. The fallout continues from the fail day of racing Saturday. Littleton, the sale GP, is Russell Coots ever going to bring that event back to not only Christchurch, but even New Zealand with all the red tapeness that he has to wade through to get the event up and organised. The PM and Deputy PM have both spoken about this today. We spoke to one councillor out of Christchurch yesterday, we had another on the programme today. ATM, episode 76, the Mark Watson podcast. If I say Marty Cup or Marty Regatta to you, what does it mean? Does it just mean a fabulous event with thousands of young people there doing their very best to, to earn trophies for their school, rowing their hearts out? Or is it some kind of colonial, patriarchal, sexist name attached to a trophy that is decades old and should be thrown into the dust heap because it doesn't represent the female rowers as much as it should? I mean, what a ridiculous assertion this is. When is this politicisation of sport, this over-the-topness where everything has to be all of a sudden torn down and reinvented going to stop? I say Marty Regatta, Marty Rowing. I just think of a whole lot of young people and their families having a fabulous time. It never occurred to me that it was sexist in any which way whatsoever. Mark Watson on that. LBP, let's be positive. Matt Gunn has to be positive, I demand about Russell Coots, about the Crusaders, and about Max Verstappen. We've got the tight five to come. We play a little game of what is more chance of happening. But as always, start the show the same way every day. Tablets in hand, I say gather my flock. It is time for a sermon. The Marty Cup is sexist. What? Yeah, apparently. Let's go to the mountaintop. We live in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots. The Marty Cup is sexist. Yes, the name demeans and belittles all the young women who row in it every year. Who says? Radio New Zealand via an article by a reporter named Dana Johansson. Now, I know Dana. I worked with her very briefly at Radio Sport. She left there to work for Stuff and now RNZ, government-funded taxpayer institution, that it is, specialising in articles and pieces promoting women's sport and bemoaning the evil male influence and dominance exerted unfairly over all women who ever dreamed of ever becoming athletes. Dana insists that the name Marty Cup is sexist because it's the boys' trophy. The girls compete for a different prize. It's called the Star Trophy. Rowing New Zealand did make a subtle name change two years ago and renamed the whole event the Marty Regatta. The problem is, outside of those, the world of competitors and supporters, an article like this for the rest of us, we don't actually care. When I say Marty Cup or Marty Regatta, what do you think of? I think of a rowing tournament involving the very best rowers, school kids, in New Zealand, something that's been going on for years and is competed for at Karapiro or Ruatanifa. And I've done sport as a job in New Zealand for well over 25 years. Interesting that Dana wrote this piece from an office in Auckland, never visiting the recent regatta, not feeling the vibe of it from ground level, not embracing the more than 10,000 people who attended. It's a pseudo-academic article, very definitely politicising an argument that in real terms is simply nonsense. It's an article deliberately aimed at nothing but polarising the people who read it, creating division, creating argument. What next? Change the Bledisloe Cup to another name because it doesn't do enough to acknowledge, I don't know, the sanctity of the Hector Dolphin in Littleton Harbour? Or cancel the name completely because Bledisloe was also a former New Zealand Governor-General from colonial times. This is how silly articles like this are. And this is what eventually they lead to. Change the name of the Māori Regatta and no one will know anymore what you're talking about. 70 years of tradition down the toilet. Just because somebody in an office in Auckland has decided that the name is sexist. Devlin. What do you want? We want information. Information. You won't get it. The platform. Lachlan. Sports News Headlines. I'll start off with some rugby news. Uh, Damien McKenzie is sitting out Friday night Super Rugby Pacific game against the Crusaders. 
coach Clayton McMillan, Chiefs coach that is, claims that the resting has nothing to do with the Crusaders' struggles. However, Martin, I beg to differ that if the Crusaders were in a strong position, winning many games, doing what they usually do, Damo would not be sitting on the bench, Joe. Yeah, and, you know, saying that he's resting... Or is he injured? Because if he injured, it makes sense. There's no sense in resting him at the moment, is there? I mean, this is one of your marquee games of the weekend for Easter weekend. You're up against the NRL and you're taking out one of your biggest names. Yeah, Good Friday. People have the day off. They've done their um, their Easter celebrations. They've had their... Well, Easter egg hunts are on the Sunday usually, aren't they? They're not the Friday. They've had their wine. They've had their bread, the body of Christ. They want to sit down and have some beer and have some kai and watch some rugby. Put out your stars. <laughs> no argument with that, mate. Um, apparently, Super, uh, All Blacks are required to have at least two games off during the Super Rugby season. This is obviously one of Damo's. Um, just bench him for the Rebels games. Bench him for the Moana Pacifica game. Bench him for the Yundrua game. Bench him for the games that, with all due respect, no one really cares about. Don't bench him for a New Zealand derby. That should at least be one of the rules. Part well, don't get, okay, I won't get into what the rules actually should be because there's many that there should be. Anyway, uh, All Blacks... Well, this says All Blacks star. He's not a star anymore. He kind of was once. He's not now. He's not even in the All Blacks anymore. I'm going to say former All Blacks halfback. TJ Perinata, he has thrown his support behind the Hurricanes' power following their recent Haka controversy, saying he shares similar views to the women's team. That's what I'm going to say about that article. No need to really say much more. Uh, it's a story that was, what, two or three weeks ago. I don't, we don't really need to keep talking about it. So the fact that, really strange that Perinara as he has come out with his support a few weeks after it happened. I would have thought he would have done it straight away. Um, Brazilian football star Dani Alves has been released from prison after paying 1 million euros, which is 1.81 million New Zealand dollars, in bail to be set free while, appear, uh, while appealing excuse me, a rape conviction. Uh, many football fans will know Dani Alves was part of that really good Barcelona side for about 10 years that had Messi and Xavi and Iniesta and Carlos Puyol and Victor Valdez, Pedro, Alexis Sanchez, and then a little later on, Neymar and Luis Suarez. Uh, two Sydney Swans AFL women's players uh, have been handed conditional release orders after being charged by police late last year for possessing an illicit substance. Uh, the incident occurred in December after the Swans AFLW season had ended with a semi-final thumping from Adelaide. Uh, the illicit substance? Uh, cocaine, apparently. Yeah, that's what I've seen on some websites. Yeah, this is apparently the first time that a couple of women have been caught doing this. Yeah, it only matter, It's only a matter of time. Look, it's just Australian sport, Australian professional athletes playing all codes of football. It's rife and it's rampant. I hope nobody's surprised by this story. No, well, it is rife and rampant. It's something that men and women in these kind of sports in this part of the world love to indulge in. I'm making, not saying that it's right, but it's very, very common. Um... Now, this was news uh, last Friday, I think. It might have been Thursday. I think it was Friday. Uh, but it's been confirmed now. But I want to say, because it's great news, former All Whites coach Danny Hay returning to coaching in New Zealand nearly two years after... Now, this article says walking away from the top job with the national men's side. He did walk away in the end, but I feel like there was a bit of a push on the way, which was a real shame. Uh, Hay has been appointed assistant coach of the new A-League club, Auckland FC. Uh, of course, joining the A-League next season. Um, top sailors are pleading with Sail GP to remain in New Zealand to keep a regatta here following the, I guess you can call it, contentious Christchurch event over the weekend. Uh, New Zealand won that Sail GP event. Uh, Sir Russell Coots, of course, coming out and lashing out at those who he believes are making it difficult to stage the event. Devian. Oh, my goodness me! The Platform. Justin Marshall, 81 Test veteran of the All Blacks, the best analyst of rugby in this country. Super rugby. Well, it is a comp full of questions for the Crusaders. Where do they even go from here? What chance of making the playoffs? Is this season done and dusted already? And Sam Whitelock back for the All Blacks. Who ever would have thought? Justin Marshall. You made some comments during the game um, that, uh, you know, you couldn't believe the line-out choices. They were failing at shortened mm. lineouts, a lack of on-field leadership, that kind of thing. Look, I thought that was their worst game yet out of the five. So where do they go from here? Yeah, I tend to agree with you. Uh, I certainly felt that defensively they were poor as well, and that's very uncrusader like uh, regardless of whether or not you can get your pattern and game plan working. Uh, you, you know, Crusader teams of the past historically always front up on defence, but to drop off 43 tackles and only be operating at tackle efficiency of below 80% is just not up to where the Crusader standards are, are set. And I know they're high standards, but... 
they have to be adhered to. So I totally agree with you. I thought it was their worst performance um, against a very good blue side, of course. Where do you go from here? You've, you've just got to try and get yourself through a really good training where you can stay positive and know that every opportunity is a chance to turn the season around and no better way to do it than against one of the, the top sides. Like If you can get that belief back by beating a team like the Chiefs, for example, then you know you can beat any team in the comp on the on your day. So you can all of a sudden grow massive confidence out of it. So yeah, they've just got to keep, keep going out there and, and trying to be positive and trying to win a game. What do you do though from here? They got the Chiefs this weekend. I mean, what mm. is, will the will the talk in that camp be just to win a game? Will it still be talking of semi finals? Will it still be talking of what could potentially be done, or will it just be let's just win a game? I think they'll just be focusing yeah on the very next game and and their performance in that game. And I feel that yes, they are suffering from uh, leadership issues because of the players that they have missing, which is well documented. But you know, the, the immaturity ha- has has to be rectified really, really quickly because it's not helping their rhythm out there. And again, yes, you're right. I was pretty critical of the fact they never adjusted their five-man line out and the Blues picked them off all night. Now, where, where is the information to, to the players? Because the management have to take responsibility as well. You know, they'll be seeing the same pictures, seeing the same thing not working. So they needed to communicate that as well as the players recognising it. So... Really, yeah. Ultimately, if they can get some of those things, the decision making right, then tactically play, you know, better, better game and put in better performance, then you know you've got to try and believe that you can win a game against the likes of the Chiefs. I, mean, I, I, I keep on asking you questions about the Crusaders, mate, and then I just think, why are we talking about this? The bottom of the table, they're zero and five. Shouldn't we be mm. talking about something else? But Justin, it is the biggest story, isn't it? It is the biggest story in terms of where the Crusaders have been, for sure. And obviously, uh, they're always there or thereabouts. Um, they, they still have, in, the, in previous years, lost games, uh, no doubt about it, and in, and in opening rounds. But they are now, obviously, on a, re- on a real low in terms of dropping their first five is just unprecedented. Precedented. So you've got, to, you've got to say that it's a talking point simply because, historically, it's never happened, and it's never happened to this side. And unfortunately... Your success breeds a little bit of jealousy and envy from the rest of the country. And so when the chips are down, um, you know, people don't have a massive amount of sympathy, <laughs> to be honest, because they know how good a side and how successful a franchise it is. And so they want to probably keep them down there because they're the type of side that if they find their mojo and, and start to click and gel, then they're capable of winning this competition like they always are. But at the moment, that's not happening. Sam Whitelock back for the All Blacks. Do you think this is is this is real? Um, look, obviously those conversations must have happened, um, and and there's no there's a lot of speculation about you know whether or not he will be back, and whether or not there's an opportunity to bring him back, whether or not the New Zealand Rugby Union will allow that. Um, I, I guess there's a lot to to discuss in that regard, but I guess my mindset is. Um, based around, you know, the players that have moved on have moved on because they're ready to move. That they're ready to try and experience something different, and, and that they're telling you that you, you're not you're not being dictated to by players being out of form or fear of being selected. You know, these guys like Sam White like have decided that they've given enough to New Zealand rugby. So why are we trying to get them back when we should be rebuilding in that area, rebuilding in in those positions and in those jerseys? to make sure that we've got a good, secure future, um, you know, in that jersey. So, yeah, it's a bit, I'm a bit, bit weary of where we're going with this, to be honest. Justin, from what you're seeing at the moment, just in terms of the New Zealand players, a couple more questions, we'll let you go, mate. Are you, are you see, I mean, if you're Scott Robertson and you're starting with a clean slate at the moment, just what do you think that he's thinking and looking at and feeling? Does he start with a whole lot of all blacks like he did at the start of the year that those guys are already cement? Or do you think he's actually looking at it thinking... I've got a blank canvas, or not entirely, but mostly a blank canvas. Well, I hope he's looking at players that is going to fit into a game plan that's going to evolve from where the All Blacks have been. And, and you know, like, after the last two Rugby World Cup experiences, plus, as you and I very well know, um, other performances that are historically changing the All Blacks' DNA forever, what, what we have to recognise is the rest of the world have caught up 
that's the way that New Zealand were innovative in, in changing the way that the game was being played, particularly 2011, 2015. You know, everyone was copying the All Blacks and wanted to, to run the block plays, the double runners. You know, they, they very much were trying to replicate what the All Blacks were doing, and we haven't evolved. So what I'm hoping is he's seeing players out there that are going to slot into a new innovative game plan that is going to change the way that the All Blacks look, and it's going to start bringing some of that success and excitement back into that jersey. And, and I certainly feel there's enough talent and enough players out there. If I was a current All Black, I'd be feeling slightly nervous because I feel that those players need to change the way they've been playing as well and fit into what Scott, Scott Robertson's going to bring. But he'll be happy. From what I've seen there, is some talent out there to pick from. It's just how you mould it all together. And finally, you know, I think we share the same mindset on this one. I certainly hope that we do. And I've been having arguments with lots of friends about this, you know, about I, I just I just would like it to be made clear that the World Cup in 2027 is actually in 2027. And it's quite a long way away. I just want the All Blacks mm. to get back to winning every single game we play. And so that the rest of the world knows that when you play the All Blacks, there's a 99% chance you're going to lose. And it doesn't matter to me what the fixture is. Every fixture is an all-black test, and that should be enough to define it, shouldn't it? Yes, it should. And that's very well said and really well put. I, I totally agree. I, I feel that every time the all-blacks are out there, that, that they are representing our, our history, and they are inspiring young kids to, to go out and want to be all-blacks. And every performance has to be a quality of performance. There's no looking any further than the test match that's right in front of you. And going out, there might be somebody watching the All Blacks for the very first time. And and they want to see the All Blacks for what they are, what they bring. You know, and um, that's performance. And, and it, it's that black jersey that, that people respect uh, globally has it, got to make sure that for every test match, it, it's out there and it's got the players performing in it and we are being entertained by, by our team and by our players. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. Devlin. Yes! Yes! Can we do it? The Platform. Are we meant to be worried about the Crusaders? Uh, I, I, I've kind of, I've got that Max Verstappen thing going on. I mean, they've just won it so many times and, and, and I kind of think it makes the competition... Well, not better, but it certainly probably makes it a hell of a lot more interesting for the neutral fan at the moment, knowing that they aren't just a rubber stamp job, that they aren't just going to dominate. Lachlan, do we still... And I'll ask Watto about this as well, uh, after 2 o'clock when he joins us, he apologised to me podcast with Mark Watson. Are we, are we still of the mindset, and when I say we, I mean most of us, that... We expect them to make the playoffs and then we expect them to be dangerous. Is that is that real or is that just because we're locked into a mindset with the Crusaders that that's what they've always been, that's what they've always done, that's what you always yeah, been? the second one. So, yeah, I'm, what I'm trying to get my head around here, is it more... Is it more like, you know, your Real Madrid, who you know every year are going to be damn good, or your Bayern Munich, you know every year are going to be damn good, or the Crusaders now are going to do a bit of a Man United, and they're just going to fall off the cliff into a bit of a wilderness for 10 years. And, 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 and we won't be talking about them in the same exalted tones, because with United now, United have not been a serious title threat for well over 10 years. And we aren't in the equation now. We're quite irrelevant in terms of a title chase and a challenge at the moment. And I just wonder, is that where the Crusaders are going? No, or, I don't or we so. just expect this bounce back no. to happen, but when is it going to happen? Yeah, I think we expect a bounce. I mean, look, there's a couple of things. One, at the moment, people will be quick to say, oh, you're making excuses. But it seriously needs to be noted how many players this Crusaders team is missing. They have their fourth or fifth string first five. Now, their first string first five is Fergus Burke who was the backup the last couple of years playing under the Crusaders' best first five, or what, well, no, no, sorry, uh, what, probably one of their two or three best first fives of all time, Richie Moanga. They are not the same side without Richie, clearly, and it's the same goes for all the other players they're missing. Will Jordan, obviously, they don't have Scott Barrett for a little bit, a number of other players, there's heaps of them. The only one who's still there is, uh, from last year's final is Tom Christie, which has been noted. So that needs to be brought into it. Factor also in the fact that... Rob Penny's in his first year. I don't care how good how good the team was when you turned up or how bad they were. When you're taking over a team, it's never easy in the first, I think, few months of your first year in charge, unless you're a, 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 a wizard. Um, as well as that, they had a pre-season trip overseas, which I can't help but think played a part in their preparation when they came back home because it's a little bit different. Never been done, or at least hasn't been done in recent years in Super Rugby. So I think all of those come into play. Now, 
They won't be down for long because these players will come back and they'll and they'll start to gain a bit. All they need is a win or two and then they'll get some momentum. The majority of this playing group have been there the last couple of years. Um, obviously, a few are not on the roster anymore, but the majority of that playing group has been there for a number of years. They know how to win. They will start winning again. And I don't think it's like football where Real Madrid are always there or thereabouts because they've got the money to always be there or thereabouts. Man United have fallen off a cliff because, with all due respect, their owners appear totally inept in being able to run a football operation as opposed to what they want to be doing, which is a business operation. So it's not comparable. Uh, the Crusaders seem to be well run because they have been for so long. They aren't um, hindered by really bad players and playing stocks and a really bad coach. They're hindered by injuries and a coach who's, I think, walked into... Look, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what Top Black had said on the show last yeah, week. Yeah, perfect storm, yeah. Walked into a perfect storm. I think it's all of those things coming together. They, 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 look, make the mo- they won't be down for long. Make the most... Because, look, if, if Rob, Pe- Rob Petty won't get sacked after this year, even if they go, oh, and how many games you play? 14. Even if they go... Our Super Rugby franchises don't sack coaches really quickly like that. But if he has another bad season next year, they might move on from him. And then the next coach coming in could be Tavadi Ellison, who's proving to be a good head coach. It could be Jason Ryan maybe coming back and getting a head coaching job. It could be Andrew Goodman, who's over in Leinster, I think, who was an assistant coach and he's well regarded by a lot of people. They're not going to be down for long. It'll be at the most probably two years, at the most. But a lot of it does, I'll come back to it, a lot of it comes down to injuries for me. All of these guys who are playing now are inexperienced. They haven't been faced with this kind of situation before. The decision-making on the field, I think, against the Blues in particular was so concerning. But it makes sense. They're... B or C grade players, they're bench players. They're not used to playing this much against an opposition that good on a prime time on a Saturday night. They're not used to it. ATM, Mark Watson, the Apologise to Me podcast. So many topics to cover. Mark was calling the Marty Regatta, formerly known as the Marty Cup, down in Twizel over the weekend. 10,000 people there in a city of, you know, city of town of just only 1,500. What a fabulous event. But it's been called sexist. What? By name. Yeah. The, the Mardi bit. It's got to go, according to Radio New Zealand. Here's what I... You were in Twizel for the Mardi Cup. And let me just explain a couple of things to you quickly, mate. When I hear Mardi Cup, do you know what I think of? And, and look, and, and I'm not a rower. I just think of rowing regatta involving a whole lot of school kids. Okay, that's what I think. I don't think boys. I don't think girls. I just think rowing regatta. So this is where I think these people get a bit insular fundamentally, if you change that name, then all of a sudden, the next thing I hear, I'm not going to connect that new name with rowing. It's going to take another 30 years to establish a brand. So why would you cock with this? Oh, you, you don't cock with it. This is sort of Dana Johansson, um, who I think in the media has always, yeah, always had a bit of a feminist agenda. And I think sometimes because of that, I think she does herself a bit disservice she tends to be the person in the media that's always going after these coaches for so-called bullying acclaim. She tried to do it with Gordon Walker and Canoe Racing New Zealand. And I'm not sure what her agenda is. Look, there is nothing sexist about this being called the Mardi Regatta. The reality is it evolved out of the Mardi Cup, which has been going since 1947. And then the girls got heavily involved in the sport back in 1981 with the Levin Jubilee Cup being presented. And you go down there, there's 10,000 people. Everyone's happy. Everyone's got a smile on their face. No one sees the Aon Mardi Regatta as being anything more than just that. It's organically grown. It's a bit like the Māori All Blacks. See, I don't see that as racist. That's just something that's organically grown and it organically grew out of just the celebration of Māori and rugby. And I think this is exactly the same. I'm not sure why everything needs to be constantly politicised. I just don't get it. No one has an issue with it down there. There's been talk in the past about having the Levin Jubilee Cup, which is the women's eight, you know, alternative years being the last event of the day rather than the Mardi Cup for the boys. And I'm like, well, good luck with that. Rightly or wrongly, um, the Mardi Cup's always been the showpiece as I said one goes back to 1947 one goes back to 1981 historically the boys race has always been a bit closer it's a bit more exciting and I can tell you right now if you ran the Marty Cup um, second to last the moment the Marty Cup's over a lot of people are just going to go and I think that would actually be a greater disservice to the girls eight in the Levin Jubilee Cup and yeah like I say it's just organically grown to what it is it is just a celebration I mean, you see girls, young girls, under 15s, under 16s, under 17s, winning novice boats, um, winning in some of the smaller boats, some of the age group equivalents. And they still consider, you know, I've just won a gold medal at the Marty Cup and, you know, I've just won a gold at the Marty Cup. And that's how it's seen, even though a lot of the trophies have their own little individual names. And it, it just does my head in that some people just feel like they've just got to, 
you know, um, you go down this line, go down this path, and you know what it's like. Everyone gets a bit edgy about it, and then, oh, you know, and they talk, oh, there's a bit of controversy over it. Like, there's no controversy. It's just one person who has an agenda who's trying to make it a controversy, and I just do that. I think they do themselves a disservice. I, I think there's a lot of ignorance. I don't see them down there. I don't see them actually observing, taking it all in, and seeing that everybody's actually just mums, daughters, everyone's just absolutely elated. It's just a really, really happy place for a week. And no no one and no one, no one is thinking about, oh, this is a bit sexist. I mean it's just it just takes the edge off what is just um, you know, what is just a wonderful week and yeah, you know, it's the biggest secondary school event in the Southern Hemisphere. Have your blues done enough? That's I don't have to argue anything about. I don't even have to contribute to that. You've just summed it up absolutely perfectly. Have your blues done enough to convince you now after putting the Crusaders to bed? No, they haven't. Um, I think we had an awful lot of possession and still couldn't do much with it. We still couldn't turn all that possession into points. You look at Middle East, the Crusaders were infringing offside, offside, offside. I mean, we played much of that game against a 14-man team. I'm just not convinced we've got the tight five, to be honest. I, I think we've got some good loose forwards. I think we've got a good back line. Um, you know, I think Patrick Tuipolodo played really, really well, to be fair, when I talk about that tight five, but he's an injury away. I'm still just not convinced about Angus Tatavau. I've never really been convinced, convinced um, uh, you know, by offer to Angavasi. I, I, I just have never understood the fascination. And if they're your starting sort of props, I, yeah, no, I'm not convinced, mate. Um, look, weather conditions didn't probably help either. Uh, I, one thing I just want to say, and I'd like, I, I would like um, Lachlan to record this, and I'd like Lachlan to note the date here. Um, Tuesday the 26th of March 2024 I think the next great all black lock we saw play on Saturday night for the Crusaders and his name is Jamie Hanna I was so impressed by this guy I just looked at him and there was something about him there was an X factor about this guy never really heard too much about him never really seen him before but write the name down Jamie Hanna I think he stood up for the Crusaders in a pretty ordinary night for them Okay, well, uh, as long as he's I, not calling short lineouts, mate, because they mucked all those up. Okay, Jamie Hanna. Yeah, right, well, I right. think I, you write down Jamie Hanna. Just, mm -hmm. just keep an eye on this okay. guy, mate. I right. think it, it, it reminds me of a young Carmo back in the day, you know, a young Ian Jones. Um, clearly, the game's, you know, guys have got a lot bigger and moved on. But just write down that name, Jamie Hanna. I think, I think alongside of Scott Barrett, I think he's a genuine star of the future. Um, look, I, I think I saw still enough from the Crusaders at times to possibly suggest and go back to what... Uh, Justin Marshall said a week ago on your show, you do you hope that these guys don't end up finishing seventh or eighth in your one or two because I still think this Crusaders team in time are still very, very capable. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. The Tight Five. Five separate sporting topics, 60 seconds on each. When the bell reminds us, well, we move quickly on to the next topic. Danny Hayback is assistant coach of Auckland FC. What a great decision this is by them. Speaking of football, Vinicius Jr., why does he cop so much racial abuse? The Real Madrid and Brazilian star speaking ahead of a friendly between Brazil and Spain tomorrow. Ten reported incidents in the last year alone. He just cops it from fans. I don't know why. Why is it him? He's a 23-year-old man. Why does he attract that? The Chiefs are going to rest Damien McKenzie against the Crusaders. Is it is it resting or is it injured? They've said rest. We've heard that he's injured. It just would seem ridiculous to rest this guy for this game this weekend. It's Easter. You're up against the NRL. It's your Friday night game. Chiefs, Crusaders. This is what is wrong with Super Rugby in a sentence. Forrest are going to appeal their points deduction. Do you give them any hope at all, Lachlan? Um, I had to put the puppy in daycare today, and I must admit, I'm feeling like a parent who just drops his kid off to school for the first time. I'm just like, yeah, 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 puppy. The Marty Cup. Should it be called the Marty Cup? Well, it's actually called the Marty Regatta. Is it sexist to call it the Marty Regatta? And two AFL women's players charged with possessing cocaine. We've got a lot to talk Sexist about. pig! Danny Hay, though, back, treated dreadfully more than 18 months ago by New Zealand football. It was one of those cancel purges that happen regularly in New Zealand. Uh, a little bit like the Black Ferns coach, former Black Ferns coach, who got dragged over the hot coals 
accused of all kinds of things. Mm. Remember? Mm -hmm. What was his name? Glenn Moore. That's right. Remember the name? He's certainly been forgotten, not talked about anymore. Uh, and, and that poor man had his reputation absolutely besmirched, uh, his character assassinated by accusations which were never investigated. Danny Hay, accused of bullying by some members of the All Whites, <laughs> wasn't he? And, you know, he seemed to bear the brunt for what were an average set of results. Well, we came very close to qualifying for the World Cup. We didn't. And then he cops it. Everyone else that was around him and his coaching group and management team stayed. Uh, but he got it from the CEO. He told me, Danny, actually, at the time, he told me, he said that the high-performance bar is set so low at New Zealand football, you trip over it when you walk in the door. He said really? there's 15 guys on laptops there, and he always wondered what any of them actually did. You it's know, a bit like when we walked into the um, Rugby World Cup Media Centre, yeah. and there's about 30 people sitting there just banging their keyboard. Banging away on laptop. And then they came in, and this is, and I've, I've told the story, I'll just tell it again oh. if, you, if you haven't heard it, but, you know, they came into the room where me and Lachlan were sitting. This is the only time that we actually went into the official media centre, which was at Roland Garros, and we thought we'd do our work out of there, but there's not a single other reporter, journalist, or any media person from anywhere in the world using that space apart from World Rugby. And they came into where we were sitting and asked us to move because they wanted to have a meeting. And then they started having a meeting about Australia being knocked out. Yeah. And we, and we overheard about 10 minutes of the meeting. And Australia had been knocked out. Yeah, Australia had been knocked out. Aussie are going home. Yeah, they've been knocked out. Well, what do we do now? Well, they've been knocked out, Lachlan. Yeah. Mm. Like, do we take down all of our Australia promotional Well, I think we've certainly, I think, I think we've certainly got to put out some kind of a statement that they've been knocked out. Honestly, I'm not joking. This is what they talked about for 10 minutes. And you're sitting there looking at these people going, and you're all getting paid? Anyway, great decision by Auckland FC to get Danny Hay back. Mm. Great decision. And for football reasons more than anything, I mean, I think he's a great guy and I think he's a brilliant coach, but the way that he plays football, ball at feet, head up, attack the goal, you know, that was what he was trying to bring to the All Whites. And the All Whites have gone backwards since he's left. And that's literally, they just pass backwards these days. We've got another game tomorrow against Tunisia. Oh, but they were, they were competitive against Ireland. They'll hang their head on that game for a little while. Oh, we while, only lost one to Egypt. Yeah. You didn't fire a friggin' shot, mate. Forrest are going to appeal the points deduction just like Everton did. Are they going to get any kind of empathy from this? This was only four, wasn't it? Was it only four. Anything that they get given back, they will take with both hands because at the moment they're back in the relegation zone. Um, I don't know if they will. Um... But, I mean, I don't know. I don't really know the nuts and bolts of the situation. To be fair, I don't really know if anyone really knows the nuts and bolts of it outside of the club themselves or the, or the Premier League. Well, they, they've they? gone over the... the they've the gone over, the, yes. the, the, the prescribed financial by how much? limit by about £10 million pounds or something. Everton were £20 million over. Everton were £20 million over, had a 10-point deduction. Reduced to six. Reduced to six. So Everton have had six points for £20 million, and Forrest have had four points for £10 million. So shouldn't Forrest then at least get... One point back. And the, if, I can, if I can equate you, use I'll my head it. for some maths. Why does Vinicius, uh, Vinicius Jr. from Real Madrid cop so much racial abuse? Why does that guy cop it? I really don't know. I, my guess would be because he's a star footballer playing for the biggest club in Spain, so naturally people don't like the club in Spain and don't like the player. And because he's um, black-skinned. And he's Brazilian, maybe. I don't know. Like, if you had, like, if Marcus Rashford played for Real Madrid or Barcelona... Would he think, be copying this? I don't think he would. That's just a guess. Danny Alves copped a lot, the guy who's, who was in prison for a rape um, and who's now being let out. But when he was playing for Barcelona, he copped a lot. He had, I remember there's a, there's a sort of a famous incident where he's about to take a corner and bananas are being thrown at him. Um, it seems more vicious in Spain yeah. and Italy than it does anywhere else. Yeah, well, we, we was that country where they had a whole lot of German fans. Oh, I actually had, there was an Eastern European country, Hungary, where they actually actually banned them from hosting games in the European Championship, oh, where they all gave the Nazis... Because no, yeah, 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 I think Israel were playing in a game or... I, 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 I just, you know, this poor young man at 23 years old, well, he's not poor, he's obviously financially rich, but just every time he plays 10 times last year... Mm. I mean, I mean, if it was a... He broke down in tears today at a press conference. That's, that's why we're mentioning yeah. it. it just, I, I, I don't have any explanation for that. I, I just, I'm flummoxed as to why. If it was a why. second or third string player on Real or a smaller club, they wouldn't be copping. I just think it's because, sadly, I think it's because he's very good. He's popular. He's one of the best players in the world. He plays for one of the biggest clubs. He's Brazilian, so he's from the, the, the central country of football, if you will. And he's dark skinned. It's probably those three, three or four things. A lot of racism used to, racism used to exist in Brazilian football as well. You just got to read anything that the late great Pele wrote uh, mm. about, you know, what he he faced growing up because he was uh, apparently too black for a lot of people there. 
Wow, I just, I'm just, I'm just, you know, this kind of stuff just, it, it just it staggers me. I just, I, I've never got my head around why somebody abuses somebody because their skin pigmentation is a different colour. Well, it's I've something that they learn it. when they grow up. Well, I, I, yeah. There was a great Chinese Lines proverb that I heard uh, the other day and it sort of talked about um, how what people are like when they're born and what they turn into. And you're not born a racist, you know, you learn that behaviour. Come on, yeah. Uh, the Chiefs are going to rest Damien McKenzie, or is he injured? Is he being rested because he's injured? Well, I've seen on a, a handful of articles that he's just being rested. Um, I didn't really see any mention of injury. But I've been all over social media today, and a lot of Twitter is saying, oh, no, he's actually carrying an injury. He's got a niggle, and that's right. Well, he's just, got a niggle. Th- this is really important for Super Rugby and from the Chiefs and from New Zealand Rugby to get the language right here. Because if he's been rested, it's just ridiculous is what it is, isn't it? Um, well, that's what the Chiefs are saying. Wouldn't they say he's injured if well, he was injured? Why wouldn't they? This is the other thing. What are, you, what are you trying to hide here? Do they want to quash fears around his oh, health? Oh no. I don't know. Yeah. But, okay. I mean, you have to be rested in two games. It doesn't say when they you, you've got to be rested. Why would Clayton McMillan pick this game? Is it, is it some sort of... Um, to yeah. get the fact that Crusaders are losing all their games, maybe? Yeah, Mark Robinson came out yesterday and just saying, you know, talking about how the CEO of New, of New Zealand Rugby is, is, is well, you know, and it just, he was talking about talk how, about how we can be more nimble and agile in the space. You know, we, I think we, we, we are you know, really hoping He was actually saying get... that the NPC is a great comp. It was only three months ago he was saying it's not fit for purpose. Make your mind up, mate. But this is where New Zealand Rugby, you've got to assert yourselves here. You're up against the NRL with another blockbuster round full of really competitive games. The Chiefs Crusaders on Friday night, Good Friday, everyone's got a day off. By the time 7.30 rolls around, probably looking to do something like sit in front of a telly because there are no pubs open, right? No, nothing's and, open. And watch some sport. Oh, some places open in the second half of the day. But, but you know, here yeah. you've got your marquee matchup and one of your greatest players isn't playing. Get it? What don't, bit of this don't you get? Yeah. Uh, two AFL women players charged with possessing cocaine. I just find this story hilarious. Yeah. I, and it's just because uh, the shock and the horror. I mean, this is what the men do every weekend. Yeah. Do you think the women aren't doing the same? Well, I'll tell you what. Head on down to the viaduct on a Friday afternoon. And just see how or, wasted or, or, everyone or a Saturday is. Saturday afternoon. All the girls were stumbling out of Oyster and Shop and Seoul. All right? There's things that have gone Ponsonby up their nose. Road. Road. You know, Road. Ponsonby Road. Dressed in their finest to. at three in the it's afternoon. The women take recreational drugs, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Uh, calling it the Mardi Regatta or Mardi Cup. Is that sexist? I'm about to ask. Yes, you. I'm offended. I'm grossly offended. There's an offended. M. There's an A. Yeah. There's a D, which you know it starts with D. Dick. <laughs> there it is. It's too there masculine. It there it is. It's too masculine. I agree with you, Dana Johansson from Radio New Zealand. It is a disgrace. It is absolutely sexist and it should be sexist, so. Sexist, Pam! Totally agree with you. Ah. Uh, Finally, little puppy's gone into daycare. And I know this isn't really a tight five topic or a sporting topic, but for everyone that does have a little pet in their lives and your children have fled the coop and all of that kind of stuff, it's a big deal, Lachlan. It's a big deal dropping them off. Look, you'll find this when you have children and that the first day you drop them off at school, mate, you hang around the gate out of... You just, you know, it's, it's a big wrench mm. because they're becoming big people and they're going to do their own thing and... This is the amazing thing about pets, and and I don't know, if you're a dog lover, perhaps you can explain this to me. A little bit off topic, but I just wanted to let you know. So we're driving to doggy daycare today. Now, we've driven there once before. Once. Now, this is through Auckland suburban streets. So windows up in the car. So the dog has got no sense of smell going on here at all, right? Yet, about 500 metres away from the place, he starts getting really excited, like he knows where he's going. He's been there once before. That was six weeks ago. It wasn't that long ago. It was in a different car as well, okay? And yet, he somehow seems to know where he's going. Mm. And then when I pull up the driveway, he absolutely knows where the place is, what it is. It's full of other little doggies and things. Mm. How do they know, mate? They're just senses. They're just, they've just what got these senses? senses. They've just got... You, you can't understand I it. I can't understand because it. Because you don't have I senses don't have like it. it. No. No. They don't have memories, though. Well, they... Pro- yes, they do. Do Come they? On. Yes, they have memories. They remember things. Like what? How to get from there to there in a car? I can't remember that. Story. Like no, no, bloody no, no. GPS. There's, a great, there's a great story um, of my very first family dog. I don't even think I was born at this stage. It was in the 90s when mum and dad were still living in Napier and they had a dog uh, called Jesse. It was like a lassie dog. Mum was walking Jesse at the park. Uh, Jesse got into a playful fight with another dog who got a bit aggressive, uh, uh, injured her, and then she ran away. And so mum's like, brilliant, I've just lost my dog. Guys walking around the neighbourhood, can't find her. This is at Anderson Park in Napier, if anyone 
who are listening is from Napier, Anderson Park in Napier, which is a humongous park. Um, and uh, she goes walking around the suburbs, around Tamati and whatnot, can't find the dog. Brilliant. Dog's run away, got a lost dog. She gets home and Jesse's waiting for her on the front step. Wow. Yeah. Oh, so, make it, make it into a movie, Lachlan. Make it into a movie, mate. You know, dogs know. Come on, let's be positive. Just stop right there. No negativity. Let's be positive. LBP, let's be positive. LBP, let's be positive. The doggies go one and two, just like the Warriors. I want you to be positive about Russell Coots. I want you to be positive about the Crusaders. And I want you to be positive about Max Verstappen. But how many times have you watched that dog's performance? Pretty much constantly. Absolutely, constantly. I just keep putting it on. Uh, I've got a couple of minutes. I think to myself, you know what? It's been so long, so long that I have to see it again. And 1996 was the last time we held anyone to zero at home. And I know it was the Titans. I, let's just move on from that. You say the Titans are in 16th. They're hopeless. They're winless. But so were we. We were there before them. So to beat a team like that and not let them even look like they were going to score, except for when uh, Top Knot, you know our mate Top Knot knocked it on early in the game uh, when he was actually over the line. But apart from that, they never look like putting points on the board. Absolutely buzzing. I just can't believe it. A green arrow and uh, climbed right up to 12th place, mate. Be yeah. positive about Russell Coots. Well, why would you want to protect Hector's Dolphins when you've got a boat race to put on, the Sail GP? Oh, look, this one, this one to me is, is one of those situations where this is the world we live in. Yeah, yeah that's exactly we protect, it. Yeah. We, 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 we protect these animals. We go out of our way to do it. People get fined. That, you know, you could go to jail for interference with these animals. If they're there, um, the likelihood of them being struck by a boat, look, I don't know what that would be. You'd think they'd clear out of town when there was a little bit of action around. But dolphins tend to be attracted to people. Yeah, they love I don't know them. much about hectares. You know, I don't know much about hectares, but, but, but dolphins seem to be intelligent and they like to interact. So, you know, yes, the fans were a little bit disappointed. Uh, Russell doesn't want to come back, but he's a dummy spitter anyway. You know, if it doesn't go his way, he doesn't like it. And most of the time, let's be honest, it's gone his way. He hasn't had too bad of a time over the last 20 years, has he? But look, you just, look it's, it's a simple fact that you can complain all you like and you can come out and say, you know, these environmental policies are going to ruin sport and events in this country. Well, I just think that's absolute madness. Now, why would anything just stop because of it? I know it's an inconvenience, but just like rain at a test match, sometimes the fans get let down. Say something positive about the Crusaders. Great argument, by the way. I'm not even here. They've got nothing to say there. Say something positive about the Crusaders. Well, the Crusaders have pleased most of the rugby world. I'll have to say that's the Thank most you. positive thing about it. Yep. I put money on. I put money on. I thought there's no way they can lose another one in a row. They're up against the Blues. Surely they're in with a show. They didn't even look close. No, they didn't. And they, they and even, even in losing that money, Martin, even in losing that money, they made me happy. And to me, that's a reason to be positive. Say something positive about Max Verstappen. It's see, exactly the same thing, isn't it? When you win and you win and you constantly win and everyone, every time they look at your name goes, oh, okay, all right, you're in the race. Uh, okay, we're playing for second place. There was, I don't know if it was a glee, but I think most people watching that F1 on the weekend, all of a sudden when he crapped out in the second lap, went, I'm going to watch the rest of the race now. Because I was only booked in for two laps, mate. And as soon as he scooted off at the front of the field, I was off, I was out of there, I was going to wait for the rugby league to start. Yeah, I've got to be honest with you. Uh, it's exactly the same thing here. I don't think there'd be another driver or another team that hasn't been hoping that this would happen uh, more often than it has. You know, Max Verstappen, clearly a terrific driver, but also clearly with the best car. And when Hamilton had the best car, he was unbeatable. When Schumacher had the best car, he was unbeatable. That's the way it goes. So we love it when they fall because they spit the dummy so hard. They're part of a team. They get it wrong sometimes. The team gets it wrong sometimes. And the parts give out sometimes. That was another triumph, Martin. And the only thing that could have been more damaging is that he didn't even 
Um, he didn't even have to look in his rear vision mirror. Him, him finishing uh, on the second lap with a broken down car is better than a victory for Formula One. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. NBA basketball, just a quick catch up with our man Ian Thompson, the soul of basketball, who wrote for Sports Illustrated, NBA.com for years. Is it simply a Celtics versus Nuggets showdown? There's less than a dozen games to go of the regular season. It's looking that way, Celtics way out on top in the East, and who really is going to upset Nikola Jokic and the Denver Nuggets on the Western Conference side of the draw? Here's Ian. Let's start where it's easy, my friend. Eastern Conference, and that is the Celtics on an absolute tear. As I speak, they got, what, a 10 or 11 game lead. The best team in the East, without a doubt. They are, uh, and there's going to be so much pressure on them when they get into the playoffs. Um, They've come close for a number of years. Uh, Their young players are now at their peak age. They went out and added two great players to join them. Uh, adding Porzingis and Drew Holiday. Drew Holiday's been out recently with injuries, but he should be back for the playoffs. The Celtics have everything they should need to win a championship. It's just, are they going to do it? And I think it's going to come down to a showdown with them and and Milwaukee. And Milwaukee is going to be an outright underdog in the conference final with Boston. Um, But as you know, Milwaukee went out and got a new coach, Doc Rivers, the former coach of the Celtics, who has improved their defense, a better rapport on the court between Giannis and uh, Damian Lillard. And I think I think if the, the Bucks are able to get to a conference final against the Celtics, they're going to love the position that they're in with no pressure on them uh, and, and having arguably the two best players on the floor when they're talking about the last two minutes of a tight game. So... Um, I think that's going to be a tremendous series if it comes to it. I know the Celtics look like they shouldn't lose to anybody, but I really think there's going to be a lot of pressure on them in the playoff series, especially against a team like Milwaukee. Western Conference then, and I've been arguing with Lachlan about this for months, as as the Nuggets have wound their way towards the top of the table. And I said, you tell me somebody that's going to take this team out because if they're fit and healthy, uh, Jokic is unplayable. You know that he's going to get his 30, he's going to get his 18 rebounds. This isn't a, a guy who, 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 who fudges his stats or tries to fluff up his stats or something. This is a guy who goes and plays every single day and he seems to be remarkably consistent more than everyone else in the league. Is that fair? Do you think he's that dominant? Yeah. No, I I, I don't know why you're having me on. I agree with everything you're saying. Oh, no, you should just, no. This should just be a one, a one-person interview here, but... Um, yeah, they look. I I see it right now going into the playoffs with health being what it is right now, and that's going to change once the playoffs start. Like somebody's going to get hurt, things are going to be different. But right now, there are three teams that I look at with a chance of making the finals. It's Milwaukee, Boston, and Denver. I, I don't see anybody in the West that the way Denver looks right now, if if they are staying healthy throughout the playoffs. There's nobody in the West that's going to beat them. Um, Oklahoma City is too young. Uh, They have no playoff experience. They're not going to beat them. Uh, Minnesota has no playoff experience. It really matters. And I I just see Anthony Edwards as maybe being too young to to carry a team uh, through a playoff, through a conference finals and into the NBA finals. He's going to do it someday, but I just don't think he's ready to do it yet. The Clippers have, have... are sliding down a cliff and James Harden uh, had a, a great couple of months for them. And now all of a sudden he's not, he's not doing so well. He's reverting back uh, to, to what his detractors think of him, that he's, he's not ready for the big time. He's never is. Um, and so I would have thought the Clippers would have been the biggest threat to the Nuggets, but the way they played the last month, um, it hasn't looked that way. Now, maybe Russell Westbrook comes back from his injury, which is going to happen this week or next week, and maybe he restores them. Maybe he brings brings balance back to their team coming off the bench as, as he does. And maybe the Clippers play their way into contention. But right now, I just don't see any team out there that's going to be done. Ian Thompson is with us, the solar basketball he wrote. Uh, a couple more questions, maybe. Thank you so much for your time. 
Is he is he going to get his props this year? If Denver go back to back and they were unfashionable last year, Ian. I mean, just just put this in perspective for what the NBA want. I mean, this is a flash and dash competition, and this is the most unlikely. I'm not going to say he's an anti-hero, but you know where I'm going with this. He's not their poster child, is he? Yet he's the best player in the world night after night. Yeah, and I think he ought to he ought to win the MVP this year. And um, if he if he doesn't but he wins the championship, then next year he wins the MVP, and it's almost like a makeup call. <laughs> you know, okay. People will vote for him next year and say we should have got him this year. He's by far the best player in the world. Um, he's the most valuable player in the world, there's no doubt, because if you look at, at the makeup of their roster, there there are no other players made the all-star team this year except for him. Um and you're right, he's not what people are looking for as far as the athleticism, but there's plenty of that. There's plenty of that. They don't need him to do that. All they need him to do is, is win. And if the Celtics were to make the finals and take on Denver, I don't know how they, they guard Jokic. I don't know what they do. Um, I don't know what anybody does because, you know, ever since Shaquille O'Neal retired, really, people have been saying – it's the death of the center position. We're never going to see centers anymore. And the whole league kind of went away from that dominating big man, the guy that takes up space and is really strong and you can't move him out of there. People thought that was, that was done. And now here comes, here comes uh, Jokic and no one's got somebody who can deal with him. The only guy that might be able to do it would be Joel Embiid, but he's out and uh, unlikely to be back for the playoffs. And even if he does come back, they're not going to be healthy, probably, and and make it to a final. So this is really setting up very nicely for Jokic. If it's a finals against Boston, it's going to be terrific. Um, uh, you know, there's there's going to be a lot of tension built into that. Um, the Celtics overall with a better talent, but Denver with a better player, and it's it's just going to be a lot of fun. Devlin. You've got to love sports. The platform. It just it doesn't get really competitive until the playoffs. And then I think it's one of the best comps in the world over the month or six weeks or eight weeks, whatever it is, for the playoffs. I really enjoyed last year watching Denver. We need to talk. And that's what we're going to we be talking about. One of your, like, talk. 17 different teams. Yeah, I, I, I was all over the Nuggets last year when I wasn't on Miami. You were on Clay Station for Next. a while. Golden was. State. Yeah. What is more chance of happening? Russell Coots. Backtracks and says, "Look, I got this all wrong. I'm sorry. I was just, I was just a bit. I was just a bit. You know, I was. I, and then, look, look, I want more layers of bureaucracy in Christchurch. I want you to make it harder for me, and I will bring the sale GP back here, no matter how many layers of management you put in front of me to get this organised. Or Nikola Jokic wins the MVP. Because the confusing thing about this, Lachlan, is we all know, as Ian says, he is the guy, the best player in the league." But he won't win it, will he? What is more chance of happening? Well, he could. I don't know who the betting favourite is at the moment. Let me have a look. Man, more chance Russell brings it back, mate. Yes! More chance. Um, more chance what, sorry? Then Russell brings it back. Then Nicola gets the MVP. Russell brings it back. Brings the sale GP back. Oh, sorry. Not Russell sorry. Westbrook. I thought you were Russell Westbrook Why would second? anyone talk about Russell Westbrook? What's um, he done in the last what, 10 no, years? The Clippers haven't had him for the last block of games and they haven't been playing so well. Maybe he's, him not being there is the reason why they miss yes. his energy. No, no, uh, no, no Jokic is the uh, bookie's favourite to win it, so yeah, he'll he'll get it then. What are more chance of happening then? So that's got more chance. Russell Coots does bring Sal GP back to Littleton. Or the no. Bucks beat the Celtics and no, take out the Eastern no, Conference. no. Um, no? I, I don't think the Celtics are an absolute lock for the finals, but if there's anyone beating them, it's not the Bucks. Mm. Next! What is more chance of happening then? Russ says yes. I, I, go, I go, oh, yes. New Zealand, I love you. I love the red tape. I love dolphins. I love iwi. <laughs> Please, come to my place. I'll cook you dinner. Or the Lakers go on a roll like the Heat did last year. Don't ask me this question. And wriggle their way through. Don't ask me. And make it to the NBA Finals, Lachlan. The Finals? Oh, there's no, that's not happening. We're no. not getting to the Finals. The Finals? I thought you were saying the playoffs or winning a series or something. We're not, mate, no way. No, not, no, no way? Well, can we beat Denver? <laughs> We're not beating Denver. 
That's our podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to listen to the entire show, one to four, Monday to Friday, download the Platform app and via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to whatever shows over however many weeks at your leisure, at your listening pleasure, Platform Plus. First thing to do, though, is download the Platform app. Devlin. Unbelievable. Incredible. The Platform.